Hello and welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Historical Humans Podcast. Today we are jumping into episode 9, where we're going to discuss the Fukushima power plant disaster. I am joined today by Colm Coleman and Gwendolyn Allen, and my name is Justin Woods. And Colm, you just want to jump right into it? You want to give us the backstory to this? All right, so right here with Historical Humans, we are taking our first ever jump into the 21st century, which, uh, unless you are watching this for some reason 80 years from now, is the current century. (laughs) Only 78 Uh, years away. Yeah. I gave him a little comfort, a little cushion there with 80 there. Uh, So we are looking at the uh, Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant disaster. Fukushima Daiichi was a nuclear power plant in northern Japan, which suffered the second worst nuclear disaster in the history of nuclear power. It is second only to the famed Chernobyl disaster of the USSR. Uh, Fukushima Daiichi was located in in the Fukushima prefecture of northeastern Japan, about 60 miles south of a major city called Sendai. It, is, it uh, was operated by TEPCO, the Tokyo Electric and Power Company. <clears throat> Excuse me there. And it was uh, constructed between 1971 and 1979. But that's not the part uh, that gets its, its lovely little mention here today. On March 11th, 2011, it suffered a power failure and went into meltdown. And so with that, I think we can uh, jump into what it was, uh, if you would like to. So on March 11th, 2011, tsunami waves were coming in and hitting the coast of Japan from the Great Sendai Great Tohoku earthquake damage plant. And it was a magnitude 9.0 earthquake, 130 kilometers or about 80 miles east of Sendai. And it caused a 15 meter high tsunami. And we use the metric system because metric is superior. And it damaged the plant's backup generators. We use the metric system because this happened in Japan. And Japan uses the metric system. (laughs) And I'm tired of converting everything. Well, the imperial system just doesn't make sense. And the thing about this earthquake or tsunami is that uh, it was bigger and lasted longer than really anyone thought that you could have predicted. Um, When looking at interviews and news coverage, uh, they say that it was beyond hypothesis. Um, So the walls that they had in place to, you know, prevent damage and, you know, have safety for tsunamis was never going to hold out. Um, It was literally uh, twice the amount uh, that those barriers could prevent and hold and it lasted a lot longer than people thought so even if it could have holded that water it wouldn't have been able to sustain for that amount of time um so this disaster a lot of people say was kind of unavoidable because you know this uh intense tsunami happened and wouldn't have even been thought of to prepare for because of its magnitude so what you're saying is the protection, the barriers that were in place would have been far surpassed by the tsunami, regardless of how much they prepared for it. Yeah, I mean, there there are definitely other things and mechanical failures that happened um, with the Fukushima incident. Um, I think a little later on, uh, we can talk about how uh, the company was made aware of things uh, and instead of fixing them, just fired the employee that brought it uh to their attention yes uh it was uh it was very interesting and like reading and hearing that through different news coverage being like yeah and so when the uh employee went to the company and said hey this is a problem they're like all right get rid of that information he's like well no i'm gonna go to the government and the government was like okay company fix this and they were like cool we'll fix it fired the employee that's how uh, that's how they fixed it and addressed it. So there were definitely problems on that end in the way that they could have fixed some of the other mechanical things. But the barrier for the tsunami and how it affected the plant, they still would have needed to do other things. Um, 
So that's something to keep in mind as we're talking about the damage that is done. Uh, yeah. Yep. And that day Japan learned that corporate corruption is something best, best left to America. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. That sounds like something I would do if I was in charge of a power plant. Just like, oh, employee, yeah, you brought a problem. Yeah, you're fired. All right. Now there's no more yeah. problem. Let's continue yeah. on with making please, money. Please stop acting cool. out your, back, Justin, your background uh, persona. <laughs> Really, uh, really having the ethics there. Uh, right. oh, okay, we're not uh, going to get into the ethics debate. That's so for a different. <laughs> another, all right. So another thing to keep in mind in order to save us all from the horrors of Justin's morality, <laughs> yes. uh, with the destruction uh, wrought on this plant, is so a 9.0 earthquake. Uh, just to give some comparison for the scale, that's the equivalent of detonating about 99 million tons of TNT just straight up detonating that 99 million tons of dynamite in a single spot. Also, you know. I was going to say earthquakes go in order of magnitude. So it's not like it, every time it goes up on the scale, it gets like magnitudinally bigger. It just exponentially goes further. And a 9.0 is almost one of the strongest earthquakes ever recorded. I think the highest ever was a 9.6 or 9.7 in Alaska. So, like, this was one of the strongest earthquakes of all time. Yeah, yep. it, it, it was intense. And, like I said, back then, uh, a lot of people would not have predicted it. Now we hear about, like, intense hurricanes and storms and earthquakes and whatnot. And we're like, yeah, the earth is trying to kill us. Move on. But, like, here, it just completely took everyone um, by surprise. Damn, nature, you scary. <laughs> <laughs> very yeah, i do have the numbers here so moving up by a magnitude of one on a richter scale is to increase the explosive force of the uh earthquake by 31.6 times that's very exponential so go to go from one to two is about the same as having 31 level one earthquakes attacking you at the same time it is not fun <laughs> It is uh, incredibly insane. So from talking about the level of power from the earthquake, I think we should circle back to the actual power plant and kind of go through some of the backstory. Like this power plant consisted of six boiling water reactors, which is uh, the same as about half of the nuclear reactors in the U.S. Right. And one, yeah, it's it's about the same as about a, a third of the reactors. It's the same as a US. third of the reactors oh, in, in the U.S., approximately one third. That's a three on the other end there. Ah, um, poor vision. It is, the best it is a it's a fairly common type of nuclear reactor. Yeah. Which one of the fun facts I I knew off, I knew and I pulled up was that Illinois, the state that we are based out of, has the most nuclear reactors um, in the United States and has the largest nuclear generating capacity in the U.S. It has 11 reactors, and that generates 11.6 gigawatts in, of electricity. I'm just going to go ahead and knock on wood during this episode. <laughs> in Illinois. Uh, just uh, going to do that a couple times throughout this podcast. Uh, yeah, but the, the standard blueprint, 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 I can't speak, um, for this reactor is that... Uh, it has these um, kind of boiling water reactors where they put in the rods to cool down, which is incredibly important. Um, and we'll go into how the radiation uh, seeped and everything. Uh, they generally have uh, about three reactors operational at a time. And uh, the fourth reactor is generally used for storage of spent rods that can no longer be used. Yep. And uh, so how this reactor worked, uh, just to give you guys a, a general idea of how it worked, is the uh, water would be pumped into the reactor, which would then be heated to produce steam. Yep. Uh, this uh, steam would be f uh, fed uh, out through the top of the reactor via some pipes and it would turn a fan and this fan would produce electricity and then the water would come down and condense and uh, be reheated again by the nuclear rods to then produce more steam to spin the fan to make more power. It's a nice little circle. 
and is about to become a circle of death. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's a very neat system, uh, but once you break the rods, uh, all hell will break loose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, that tends to be the case with these systems, is they are perfectly efficient, and they're actually, believe it or not, one of the cleanest methods of electric electricity generation. It just... The risk versus reward tends to be fairly high when things go wrong. Yes. Uh, Like, you know, having a plant that relies on irradiated water get flooded by a massive tsunami. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And one of the big things, too, is that, you know, of course, a lot of these are electricity ran. They generate electricity. So a lot of the mechanisms are held through that. And so... When a tsunami happens, generally, you don't have power, <laughs> as m- most natural disasters. Um, and this tsunami took out the plant's backup generators. And okay. that is really important. Yeah, that's key. Because the Fukushima power plant did manage to successfully turn itself off. They did. They were not generating uh, nuclear power at the time of the disaster. The tsunami uh, came in. The warning system gave them about 10 minutes i think and they successfully turned off all three active nuclear uh nuclear jet nuclear reactors the problem is without the backup power they couldn't exactly keep them off (laughs) yeah so the cooling system failed (laughs) and that is very important because then the residual heat causes the fueling rods to partially melt down which is not something you want to happen when you're dealing with the nuclear energy and materials. Yeah. Nuclear reactors are basically giant ovens. And if you do not cool them down, you will literally begin to melt the earth. <laughs> Which is yeah. exactly what happened because the melted rods bore holes through the bottom of reactors one and two, which exposed nuclear materials in all the, in the cores. And it, yeah. it took them a few months to realize that the holes were even there. Yep. Just a little bit. Yeah, the massive flooding and also um, the fact that the containment buildings for reactors one and three both detonated following yes. the tsunami <laughs> made it very difficult to go looking for holes in the bottom of the reactors. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, this is a story of things going from bad to worse to somehow still worse. <laughs> yeah, and they exploded through hydrogen gas, which I think is, maybe not most people know, but uh, hydrogen, very, very explosive. Uh, it's how very you nasty. power the sun, everybody. It's also how you power yeah, the Hindenburg. But, yeah, and I mean, you know, the H-bomb, whatever. Uh, so, you know, that explosion of hydrogen gas was not good at all, and they exploded within two days of each other. Uh, so, like, March 12th uh, was Reactor 1, and March 14th was Reactor 3. Yep. So, with, within two days, you had two big z- explosions um, in those buildings. It's not good. Not good at all. Uh, and then the workers pumped seawater and boric acid into the course to try to cool them to, you know, minimize damage. Yeah. Uh, fun fact, this uh, this little response was actually going to create problems for them later on down the road. Because yes. as much as it is an immediate solution to the fact that, you know, the rods are overheating, it's also putting a bunch of water into buildings that are being compromised by, explo- by explosive detonations. <laughs> explosive detonation and radioactive material. Yeah. Um, so now that water is contaminated and cannot be recycled very well. Um, and like e- even a decade later, you know, that that's still a problem that uh, Japan is dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, by uh, by March March fourteenth, uh, the government uh, had established a thirty kilometer uh, no fly zone around the reactor, just keeping everyone out. And they evacuated everyone who they evacuated everyone who lived within twenty kilometers of the plant. Uh, so about six hundred square kilometers or two hundred and thirty two miles of area were just 
you know, everyone was told, pack up and leave. And then on March 15th, the third explosion occurred surrounding in the building surrounding Reactor 2, which yep. ended up punching a second hole in the containment vessel around the nuclear rods. Yep. So they had to expand the radius to 30 meters. Um, but I will say that uh, Japan was like very immediate in their response very quickly, which is probably the reason why no one immediately died from uh, from this happening. Uh, there were a couple deaths due to uh, radiation and a couple other things, but no many deaths, which for a level seven, <laughs> Yep. is 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 very uh impressive yeah the uh the only uh the only immediate deaths uh associated with uh with this disaster were three nuclear plant workers who were killed by the tsunami hitting the plants uh yeah. they were not killed by the, the reactor melting down they were killed by the actual uh nightmarish force of nature that had come to wreak havoc on the island yeah not the secondary man-made one yeah and uh to uh keep this going uh with uh that third explosion on March 15th, uh, some of the fire got to reactor four. Oh no. <laughs> uh, which is the reactor that was currently being used to store all the spent, highly irradiated nuclear waste rods from the other three reactors. This fire just, basically you are igniting nuclear waste at this point. So it's just radioactive nightmare. It's it, it's 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 just bad. It just starts releasing nuclear radiation just into the immediate surrounding area at a rapid and honestly terrifying rate. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. So the workers definitely did several attempts to to cool the plant. Of like they had uh, truck mounted water cannons and helicopter water drops to try and kind of diffuse that. Um, which helped a little bit, um, yep. but it, it reduced some of the radiation liquid leakage, but uh, rising steam and smoke oh, were going to no. increase the risk of radiation mm -hmm. to the surrounding areas. Yeah. B basically, nuclear radiation is like the T-virus in Resident Evil. It bonds with whatever the hell it's in. So you put yeah. it in water, it bonds to the water. You put it in steam, smoke, or the air, it's going to bond with the air, and it's going to get out that way. Which is yeah, exactly what happened. Yeah, and with the wind, that's also going to travel, you know, vast amounts of areas, which is one of the other things that's happened with Fukushima and the area around it, is there were zones affected um, geographically wise that they hadn't anticipated because, you know, mm -hmm. the steam flows with the wind direction yep and so. this ended up just contaminating a lot of things and it actually ended up contaminating local food and water supplies like you said yeah. it just attaches to everything so now the government started issuing warnings of like watch what food you're eating watch what you're drinking because because it could be contaminated like it yeah. spreads and it does not go away not it's only that tea or deadly poison <laughs> you can't not tell only <laughs> this also really hurt the economic side of Fukushima because the people that did want to stay, they uh, they the businesses couldn't even sell you know food or or fish or anything that they had done because it had all been contaminated and especially you know the seawater around the area and so now they're like okay I wanted to stay in like my ancestral home where I grew up you know. Uh, I'm a resident of Fukushima, but now I have no way to make a living because I can't. And then you're also importing food from other places. You know, there's a lot of things that go on to this that's not just the immediate disaster or the radiation, but it has profound, you know, economic and social impacts as well. Well, and you hinted slightly at it. By the end of March, the seawater around the plant was found to be contaminated with iodine-131, which is highly radioactive. It is, yeah, it is, yeah, it is essentially the, um, it's the radioactive material involved in uh, these types of nuclear power plants. Uh, it's, you know, it's 
it's a very radioactive element and it's just been dumped into the water at this point. And it was yeah. it resulted from leakage of contaminated water via the cracks in the tunnels under the plant. So it's yeah. like yet another domino falls in this like storm yeah. of just malfort misfortune. Yeah, between yeah. the earthquake, the tsunami, and the series of explosions that occurred at the plant, the foundations and the uh, underground tunnels designed to help contain uh, the these types of leaks. They had been broken apart and the government had been dumping water onto radioactive materials into what is essentially a wicker basket as it just now leaks out the bottom and proceeds to poison everything around it. Yeah. And they had only uh, finally sealed the cracks April 6th, you know, so this took a long time and that's still going on that entire time that they're trying to seal the cracks, which is only just furthering the situation. Yep. Yep. Uh, once they had sealed these cracks, uh, they began to uh, pump a lot of the contaminated water out from the plant into some temporary storage sites they had built uh, right next door to the now very much ruined reactors. Yeah. And this was a, they're finally, they're finally a, a full month later getting to the part of cleanup where they can actually start getting, containing and controlling the nuclear waste as opposed to just desperate damage control. Yeah. Well, and like Gwen mentioned earlier, this, it, it was a, actually on April 12th when the nuclear regulators actually elevated the security level of the disaster from a five to a seven. So it went from a bad disaster to an oh shit disaster with that declaration which is the highest level of nuclear emergency and it was um in the same category as chernobyl which is probably like the prime nuclear meltdown example it is yeah <laughs> prime it's the worst one <laughs> yes yeah. Fuku, Fuku, fukushima is the only nuclear disaster besides chernobyl to ever rate a seven wow. yeah. and it is considered second only to Chernobyl in terms of its severity. Um, uh, this is this is of course as assessed by the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is a watchdog group uh, designed to monitor and help curtail uh, incidents of of you know nuclear reactor failure. So it was bad. <laughs> yes. Very bad. Uh, but again, no immediate deaths, which is very, very good for a level seven of being like the worst yeah. possible level. Yeah, it um, is. It is. Yeah, it is definitely the lack of a death toll, especially an immediate death toll that uh, makes Fukushima less uh, less horrific than Chernobyl because Fukushima did not result in major loss of life. <laughs> Except yeah. while that is a huge positive, there still were a lot of injuries that resulted because of it. Like from oh, the yeah. meltdown explosions, there were 16 workers that were hospitalized, three more from radiation exposure. And God knows dozens more were exposed to high levels of radiation to begin with. Yeah. The, uh, the Japanese government, uh, however, has shown a commitment to, uh, I guess, taking care of a lot of these workers uh, after the fact. Uh, in 2018, one of the workers did die from uh, radi did die after being exposed to the radiation. Uh, it took him seven years to die. And the Japanese government uh, did des decided that it was right and necessary for the government to compensate his family, given uh, the essentially the nature of his death being from handling the, the nuclear disaster. Yeah, well, the the government itself and uh, the company uh, in a lawsuit, I cannot remember the exact year, if you guys know, tell me, um, were actually found guilty um, for the Fukushima incident um, for not handling certain things properly. So that is probably one of the reasons that that happened um, but also like the, again, like the government did a really good job, um, of being immediate, even if before, you know, there were things that they could have done to prevent it, uh, from this level. 
Yes, uh, the I think the trial you're referring to, uh, Gwen, uh, there was in 2019, uh, a case went to court uh, for three te- of uh, t- people who were TEPCO executives at the time, TEPCO being the company that managed the Fukushima yes. plant. Uh, in 2019, three of them were on trial for negligence. Yes. Uh, it was the only criminal case to come out of the disaster. And... Uh, I do not believe anyone was char- what was uh, um, was found guilty. Well, I think they all walked. I could be mistaken in that. So there was uh, some accountability, and then there was not much. I yeah. feel like there was accountability that they were f- they were found to be in the wrong. I don't know if they got like any jail time or money or whatnot, but I I feel like that is what I remember in uh the documentary that i watched but yeah yeah uh in 2012 the prime minister of japan did say that the state uh shared the blame for the disaster and in 2017 a court did rule that the government uh had some responsibility and had That's to pay probably what compensation I'm to ev- and they had to pay compensation to evacuees uh however That's probably um, what i'm thinking of then yeah. Yeah, there was a civil case in 2017 where uh, it was determined that the Japanese government owed all the people who had to abandon their homes overnight. Uh, mm-hmm. It was determined that they owed them money for, you know, essentially forcibly evacuating them. Yeah. And uh, the criminal case in 2019 uh, for the uh, uh, for for the TEPCO executives. Uh, Let's see. I do not believe they were convicted. Yeah, they probably didn't serve any jail time. But... Yeah. Of course, because those in top tend to walk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think we're all pretty much used to that, but <laughs> I do believe they were found <laughs> like wrongful and, and had a hand in it. Though it also could have been the documentary's like wording of that statement that makes me think that. So, no worries. Thankfully, columns coming in here with the the facts and the the written stuff, and I'm just like, this is what I remember. Let me tell you. So, yep. Though while column is looking that up, I will say, um, you know, there when when we look at uh, deaths and you know hospitalizations and the physical toll that this um, disaster put on people. I don't really think a lot of people take into consideration the amount of stress, anxiety, and social stigma that also comes with this because Japan went through Hiroshima. So there is already a lot of stigma around nuclear disasters and being affected by them. So the people that are moving away from Fukushima that are trying to build their lives again somewhere else, they're also getting stigmas of, well, could could you have radiation? Are you going to give that to me? Should I be around you? And those kinds of things. And that's very big. And also the anxiety of have I been exposed to radiation? What is that going to do to me? What does that look like? Even though in tracking it, um, because there were civil, uh, like uh, civil servants basically um, that did their own tracking of the nuclear, um, or I guess radiation levels, as well as the government ones that tracked it, and they said that you know overall good job going down and whatnot but that's still a lot of anxiety that is going to take a heavy toll on it and then there's also social stigmas and anxiety around that that's also going to take a physical toll Uh, yeah i do also think you're missing a slight section there of just the the societal trauma that's associated with it with the previous atomic detonations like people have been through that and people experience that and even though that had been what 70 years prior by that point it still has a toll on the people and like the fact that this keeps i I don't want to say keeps happening because there are different instances where the radiation was was input but still like that does 
have an effect on yeah. society. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, that, that is years. a social charm as well. Yeah, it is 66 yeah. years from Hiroshima and Nagasaki to Fukushima. Mm -hmm. uh, so people who live through one, uh, very good chance they live to see the other. Yeah. Um, and uh, as for your question before, uh, Gwen, uh, I've dug through my bottomless barrel of facts, uh, burrowed in very deep. And mm -hmm. so the 2019 uh, case against the three former TEPCO executives, uh, they were found not guilty of negligence. Uh, this went, uh, this was then appealed to the U.S. Uh, Ninth Circuit's court via TEPCO's partner, General Electric, an American company which uh, uh, and the Ninth Circus Court of America in 2020 upheld the dismissal of charges against uh, against the executives with prejudice. Wow. Really? It upheld okay. the charges. With, it held up. It, 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 held, it upheld the not guilty verdict with prejudice. To those playing at home. I with, stand corrected. <laughs> to those playing at home with prejudice means the case can never be tried again. That that is like a final determination. So it is huge for that to have been upheld yeah. with prejudice. Yeah. The only That's I think crazy. the only I think the only way uh, as far as American law is concerned is for this to ever go to trial again is for a direct appeal to the Supreme Court of the United States of America. And even then, they might just dismiss it out of hand on account of it being already dismissed by a court of appeals with prejudice. <laughs> Not to mention for it to get to the Supreme Court, it'd have to go through all the circuit level appeals, yeah. your courts, appellate. Like yeah. There's it's not there's an a easy million step. layers of bureaucracy between it and there <laughs> for it to get kicked up, yeah. all of which can just say it was dismissed with prejudice and completely ignore the case. Yes. I mean, the American justice system literally tries to make it incredibly addictive. Um, difficult to do appeals even though that's like the constitutional right they're like no 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 we'll just put every barrier in place uh yeah i stand corrected uh crazy yeah so then um kind of shifting forward uh mid-december 2011 Gwen, if you want to help me with the prime minister's name because i do not speak japanese and i am really trying not to offend anyone yeah, uh, so Prime Minister uh, Noda Yoshihiko. Uh, declared the facility stable, which followed a completion of a cold shutdown of the plant. So thankfully they, they were able to get everything kind of kind of calmed down. They turned all the, the power generation off, so no more new generation. And, and, and no just to jump in uh, real quick, uh, what cold shutdown uh, means is that the reactors are not running and the reactors are not hot. Uh, when the plant was successfully shut down uh, immediately prior to the tsunami hit, it was the reactors were not running, but they were still very hot, which led to a lot of the overheating problems that created the explosions and the uh, boreholes in the reactors themselves. Yeah. So the reactors are no longer hot and they're no longer running, which is what you need. Sorry about that, Justin. <laughs> no, no, that's perfect. That gives context. Like, I think that's what what helps us out too, as as the three of us is, you know, we say something. If you have context, please feel free to jump in and yeah. add that because Just, yeah. what we know <laughs> someone else may not know. <laughs> I'm still crawling my way out of my bottomless barrel of facts, so uh, you know I burrowed in very. Sorry to throw you so down there, Colin. I just wanted to be I'm out checked. of words right now, so please carry the podcast on. I'm out of words. Gwen, why did you push Colum down the hole? <laughs> well, because I was like, hey, I remember this being said in the documentary, but you know, you know me. I, and they I were probably referring to the civil case against the Japanese government, exactly. you know, for compensation for evacuees, not the criminal case against the TEPCO executives. Yes. Uh, so I, I needed Colum <laughs> to, to give context and, and double check me, you know, checks and balances, the good American way. Yeah, yeah like you guys correcting me instantly, simultaneously <laughs> on numerous occasions. We have done that multiple occasions. <laughs> we, we, we do this frequently off screen. Uh, Justin will say things and he'll get words wrong and we'll just yell at him. In, yep. in unison, together, they both will just shun me. <laughs> 
We have we're, one we're voice. We're just showing our friendship and our love for knowledge and violently. Kind of yes. Exactly. <laughs> Aggressively. Back on the topic of uh, of Fukushima. Yes. Uh, um, which the Fukushima disaster actually really changed the way Japan did uh, their energy and relying on. So, like when this was like a cold shutdown. Uh, a lot of people did not want any more nuclear power plants in Japan, or they wanted a severe reduction from this. So that's also very interesting. Well, and that's a very common trend too now, not just in Japan, but across the world is a lot of places are specifically um, leaning themselves off of nuclear power and um, nuclear uh, power generation because of its risks. There's very strong arguments to be had about the safety for nuclear power. It's actually one of the safest. However, like I said, high risk, high reward, like there tends to be pretty big fallout. So it's kind of a universal push. But yeah, in Japan, they really they stepped up their fervor in that argument of trying to make it worse. Yeah. And uh, just to clarify the high risk, high reward, uh, nuclear power isn't risky in the sense that it's liable that something is going to go wrong. Nuclear power is risky in the sense that in the event something does go wrong, we're all dead. <laughs> yes. And the big thing with Japan is when they're like, okay, we're going to lean off nuclear energy because of what happened with Fukushima. They leaned in to a lot of the um, coal and oil, which is not good for the environment. No. Um, I, I believe now they're really going into more like uh solar and i think wind uh, uh I think japan, it, it, to I balance think, that out hmm? i think japan likes wind a lot because of the uh yeah. a lot of the a lot of the terrain does have a nice ability to funnel wind for consistent use yeah so they're trying to lean off that you know uh gas and oil because they they also don't want to be relying on uh foreign oil which is why they took up nuclear power plants and, and why they had uh, so many on the island but yeah yeah and uh fun fact uh with uh japan's opinions on nuclear power they're actually shifting back in favor of it recently yeah. as a uh as a poll from march 2022 so just uh just last month at the time of this recording uh by the japan times showed that 53 percent of the people uh believe that if you can safely turn fukushima back on you should which yeah. is the first time since the disaster that a majority of people have been in favor of using nuclear power. Yeah. Because it is so clean compared to the other energies that they're, that they had been relying on since then, they're like, well, now I'm worried about, you know, global climate change and the effects that this has. So what can we do? Yeah. And Which so we see that lean again. Yeah. And uh, the number of people in favor does seem to be growing uh, very rapidly because Japan Times also had a poll from September of 2021, which showed a uh, 44% in favor of restarting the plant. So it's a 9% increase in, I believe, half a year. So it's people are, so there is definite momentum with this sort of idea of, you know, clean energy in Japan of going to something that is you know, high risk, high reward, like nuclear power is. Yeah. But kind of circling all the way back, we should. Yeah, sorry. I kind of <laughs> derailed that just a little bit. Yeah, derailed let's the go timeline. through the rest of the timeline here because uh, we've only made it to December of 2011 uh, in terms of dealing with this disaster. Which after that additional corridor of land was designated for evacuation in the months following the, the disaster, which, um, this is because with it happening in the 21st century, there actually was a lot of study done with it and a lot of research done in the fallout patterns. So how that radiation actually affected, where it actually traveled, you can actually look up radiation maps of how the how it actually traveled. Mm -hmm. And this new area covers 207 square kilometers or about 80 square miles of land. And mm -hmm. radiation levels remained high for months in these evacuation zones. Yeah, and this uh, th this adjustment was uh, was made primarily because the initial projections in March uh, were, in some ways, miscalculated or miscalibrated just that little bit yeah. between what sh what was expected to happen and what actually did happen, and 
uh, about nine months later, the Japanese government realized, hang on, there's this whole other section of people that are actually in danger. Yeah. <laughs> we should probably save them. No, they're not. They're not liable to just leave their uh, leave their people to die at this point. But the thing that's that the find- beautiful thing about Japan is that there is a very like collective instead of individualistic mindset. So like you want to help your community and you want to help your nation. And that that really leads to, uh, I think, a lot of uh, government policy in the way that they handle things. Um, yeah. I just think it's yeah, kind of nationalism in Japan has really uh, it's really done a lot of good throughout all of history. <laughs> okay, Colin, okay, Colin, okay, I'm okay. No, my no, words. no. I am I am blocking that conversation off right here. We are not going to go down that route. If you want to see an episode about Japanese imperialism, be sure to leave a comment down below, and Colin can rant for hours on that. Don't worry, we will talk about Korea. Hideyoshi. But- has but some anyways, ideas. coming full circle, it's like that radiation zone that they established, <laughs> it was kind of interesting to me because some towns that were just outside of that zone were deemed safe for habitation, like within 20 kilometers. So not yeah. a very big zone. And there it's like, yep, along this line, you are okay. On this side, you are not. You're okay to live right here, just adjacent to the yeah. border. Yeah, J- Japan yeah. feels like the sort of place that you could take a... Uh... Uh, take a paintbrush, draw a white line halfway through town, and people would actually respect that line. <laughs> I think you got to go with ages there, but yeah, I mean, if they're like, if there's a reason the line has been put here. Uh, you know, like, all right, this, you know, this side of the line is not radiated. That side is. Good luck, guys. <laughs> <laughs> But then government, the government also began to allow limited business activities in those areas of moderate business radiation. So, like, you're okay to live here. Here's the white line. And you can work over here, but only so far. Yeah, yeah it was a method for Japan to reclaim a lot of business assets that had been left behind in all the towns and cities that had to be evacuated because of this. Uh, yeah. It was, you know, these areas are not safe to live in. But you can go in for a few hours and do work uh, because this is 2011 and work from home and remote work is still not a thing. (laughs) Thanks, COVID. (laughs) Kind of a good thing, though. (laughs) You said that in the thanks Obama meme, but like, I mean, honestly, though. (laughs) We've set set Gwen off, guys. Here we go. It's going to be fun. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. uh... Poking out of my barrel. I want vengeance. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, though there are some really um, amazing stories of the people that did still go into Fukushima to still do things. Um, I I know I did mention one to Column off screen. Um, one of my favorites, the most prominent one, was a guy who actually stayed behind. And he yeah. stayed behind because he collected everyone's abandoned pets and would just take care of them. He, he said he was like mid fifties at the time or sixties and was just like, I've lived my life and the radiation won't affect me as much as it will a younger person. I'm going to take care of these pets for the rest of their years. Like it's not their fault. This happened. Yes. The Japanese cat man. (laughs) Show I love that you talk about the cat man and my cat just decides that she's going to come up. It's like I heard that you were talking about cats. And and that the cat in question wasn't me. <laughs> That's the key thing with the this cat. This is preposterous. Technology. There's a difference uh, between being a cat and being catty, Colum. Colum. I think Colum was speaking uh, for my cat there, not for himself. <laughs> but sure. I just, I had to make the jab. I had to. Yep. I, uh, it's like, welcome to this week on Confusing Justin with Semantics. <laughs> uh, <laughs> next week, we will have the semicolon. <laughs> no! At least it's not the Oxford comma. Thank God it's not the Oxford comma. But in, you uh, watch Word Crimes again, Justin? Continuing on this timeline, as the derail train keeps derailing. We're, uh, so, we're on topic. We're on, we are on track. Also, we can never we're cover just trains off the because timeline. of Justin's train analogies. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, oh, but by, that today. <laughs> by July of 2013, the evacuation orders were lifted in some areas and in the 20 mile kilometer evacuation zone. 
Only in areas that have been characterized by the lower levels of radiation, though. Yeah, yeah. And but, uh, so 2013, two years later, the disaster wait, is over. More. Everything's fixed. We can finally re relax. Hooray, Japan. You did it. You survived. <laughs> in, great, in great infomercial style. But wait, there's, there's more. more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. We don't get to end the video here because in... August of 2013, just one month later, just one month after they start trying to repopulate the area, the second Fukushima disaster breaks out. Part two. Yep. Yeah, electric boogaloo. Too fast, uh, too Fukushima. Yeah. Remember how we said all that water they were dumping in was going to come back and buy them in the butt? And we kind of, it kind of already did when it started leaking out of the broken shell of a building that was there. Well, now it gets to leak out again. <laughs> Yep. Oh, no. Yeah, all the contaminated water that was used in the cooling operations began to be discharged into the landscape. About 330 tons of water was leaked. And for some reason, that is not the same as a nautical ton, T-O-N-N-E-S, uh, which was only 300 nautical tons. Why do we have the same name for things that are honestly, it's a different unit of measurement with the same name for the same thing? It was confusing me so much reading that. I was yes. like, what, what is the difference? An N and an E, that's the difference. And I'm so confused. Let me, let me put it this way. There's a mile and there's a nautical mile because the Navy has to have its own freaking version of everything. So there's a ton the for weighing things. And then there's a ton for weighing water. <laughs> well, and that's I'm a so ton frustrated by this fact. <laughs> It's like they heard the, 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 what is it, like riddle or a question or something? What's heavier, like a pound of, of feathers and a, a pound of bricks? Well, yeah. And they were like, oh, well, if we did that with tons, of course it'd be different because water is weighed differently. Nothing. It just makes me think of the, um, God, what is it, Monty Python? Like, how much does a witch weigh? <laughs> yep. So, this particular leak uh, uh, was was the result of an open valve in uh, what was a short barrier wall that was constructed around the water tanks. They had corralled the water into tanks, and they had built a little wall around it just in case the tanks broke. And one of the valves that was designed for pumping water in and out of these tanks uh, in the short wall, it broke and was uh, forced open, and all the water started coming out. So much water, in fact, that this was classified as a class three nuclear disaster. Oh my God. And so, keep in mind, we are operating on a pseudo Richter scale, but this one goes from one to seven. So we went from a five initially to a seven, and now we're back to a three. Good yep. job, guys. Separate but on the bright side, we're all odd numbers, you know? Very prime. Very prime. Yeah, yeah Very we prime. are. Uh, yeah, it seems we are in a rush to get where we are going and are just going for the big guns. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So this was a, uh, this was very bad. Uh, this, was, this, was, this was very bad. There wasn't a lot they could do once the water was out. They did manage to stop the leak uh, fairly quickly. But by that point, you know, they, the water was just in the land, in the sea. It was just there. There was no fixing it. But on, on the plus side, by March 2017, all the evacuation orders had been lifted. The only yep. exception is in the difficult to return zone, which, as the name may imply, it'd be a little <laughs> more difficult to return to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's uh, 100. It's uh, 143 square miles or 371 square kilometers of territory just immediately around the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear reactor that is just the ground zero of this uh, pseudo atomic bomb <laughs> that went off. <laughs> because Which, I don't know what else to call it when you have three separate hydrogen explosions and massive leakage of radiation. <laughs> look, we, we don't quite talk about that. <laughs> what are you gonna do? We don't talk about Fukushima? No, 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 you know, no. Hugh and Canto, get us a copyright <laughs> strike from the Empire of Mouse, do it. <laughs> do it but, there's way too many syllables oh my god 
Colum, you are very combative today. You are trying to take on am, the world. I am angry. I am angry at everything. Uh, I'm in my barrel, and I don't like to be there. <laughs> Ew, I thought I was supposed to be the emo of the group. What's going on? Listen, you came back from death. I did. I, I had to pull your weight. <laughs> I am not a zombie. It has not been confirmed. <laughs> you are 100% a reanimated corpse, which is a debate from off screen. But Gwen is not alive. Yep. She is dead and reanimated yep. as a corpse. Yeah, she is dead. Uh, and more specifically, she is dead to us because as a result of becoming very, very sick, she was unable to uh, to make uh, last uh, the previous podcast, episode eight. And we had to do it by ourselves. So, you know, there is just huge seething resentment just you, you know, know how... a 15 meter high tsunamis worth of just <laughs> coming know how expensive her way. it is to hire a good necromancy ne good necromancer in this day and age like it costs a lot of money just to resurrect her yeah i know it must have sucked too because you couldn't call me to do it and get a friend discount <sighs> well that's what happens when our necromancer dies yeah all right, all right, enough, uh, enough, okay. enough, absurd, enough of the absurd fantasy talk. Uh, uh, yes. He's a gamer nerds. All right, <laughs> all right. So, uh, you know, in March 2017, the evacuation order was lifted, except for that one zone right in Fukushima, and uh, well, that doesn't necessarily mean that the radiation uh, managed to go away. Uh, there is a 2016 report on all that radiation, all the water and everything else that sort of leaked away into the rest of the environment. Um, they found that it was uh, mostly gone. It had dropped off a lot. It was still above the pre-disaster level, but there are certain uh, certain species that seem to have absorbed it. Yeah. Like, yeah. The, uh... like the sedentary rockfish. Yeah which they look cool. Um, now they're just radioactive. Is that what you would call them is cool looking? Yep. Yes. They're they kind are, of they are horrific. Tiny night, they are tiny nightmares. That yes. is why they're cool. They are horrific looking. Oh, yeah, no. Uh, mm -mm, mm -mm. Y'all are hating on this fish. It just, you know, it, it's it a just evolved to what it evolved to. The ocean mm -hmm. is terrifying. The thing looks like if... The thing looked like if an Ichiosaur learned how to swim, the giant death fin on its back. <laughs> you see why she likes it. You see why she likes it. She likes all things horrible and nightmarish. She likes to be the contrarian who likes all the morbid, gross, weird things. So like They're not gross. I'm literally wearing my nightmare before Christmas shirt, which I find very funny because I like that movie solely for uh, the Halloween town. I think it looks cool. But yeah, so now these fish are radioactive, which um, sucks for them and the rest of the ocean life. Um, but also kind of cool in a way, but yeah. But uh, to get back on track, uh, in 2020, Japan announced plans to release the diluted contaminated water into the Pacific Ocean. Which is another way that this water is coming to bite them in the ass. And also, you know, the 2016 was like, all right, we think the radi radiation levels have dropped significantly. The ocean is starting to recover. Yep. And now they're like, well, if we just dilute the water, yep. it'll be okay. The, yeah. There's an important thing to talk about with that, though, is it's not like they're just dumping it in barrels off the side of their coast yeah. they're talking hundreds of thousands hundreds if not thousands of nautical miles offshore and it's already diluted and then when you put it further into a large body of water such as the pacific ocean it really negates the effect so it's not as bad but there still is some ethical concerns some problematic concerns about putting such high levels of radiation into an area but they're hoping that it gets diluted and um, spread about, basically. Yeah, the logic is that the Pacific Ocean and the places they want to dump it are current zones, will sort of force the radiation to be spread over thousands of thousands of miles. And at that point, you know, you're looking at one or two parts per million as opposed to, you know, one or 200. Yeah. 
there is still a debate going on. It is. Um, yeah, there is concerns about the safety of it. Uh, from Japan's perspective, it's better that the radiation leaks out there than into their soil. Uh, should a leak spring in their, uh, you know, in their containment facilities again, like it did in 2013. And uh, from the rest of the world's perspective, uh, people do tend to use the Pacific for things like <laughs> fishing and, you know, a resource of food. <laughs> Not to mention, they also tend to like to use the Pacific for nuclear bombs testing, like the United States and the Bikini Atoll, we don't talk, we don't talk the Marshall about Islands. <laughs> I love my perspective is just, you know, there's there's things <laughs> that live in the Pacific Ocean, maybe don't want to be contaminated by radiation. Uh, we already fuck up the ocean enough uh, that there'll be more plastic than fish in the ocean in like I think mm. two years. See Great Barrier Reef and uh, white coral. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that that is an ongoing debate, and also like just yeah. down the line that this you know disaster is still affecting Japan and the world. Yeah. And uh, the uh, Japanese Prime Minister in 2020 uh, did say that they had no intention of delaying the dumping of this material, despite uh, concerns from international organizations and other countries. However, mm -hmm. they were, I do believe they were in fact delayed by the pandemic, uh, the COVID, the COVID <laughs> pandemic. So uh, they ha I do not believe they've gone through with this. Uh, I did not find any sources saying they had, so I have to assume that COVID locked it down before uh, they could get out there. Yeah, and I mean, that makes sense. Yeah, you, you're not gonna endanger your people to a plague uh, just to get rid of uh, what is essentially another plague. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then yeah. one yeah. of the things that I thought would be kind of an interesting counter perspective, because we did bring it up a couple of times in this podcast, is what if we kicked it over to Chernobyl and look at some of the comparisons between the two worst nuclear disasters ever? Yep, the only two that are even in the same category with each other. God help us all. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I'll bring us down to Chernobyl, I guess. So Chernobyl is the only other class seven nuclear disaster. It occurred mm -hmm. in Chernobyl, Ukraine, back when Ukraine was part of the USSR on April 26, 1986. God, uh, what is, is with spring? It's just, it's, you know, you know, you know, they say, you know, you know, April nuclear showers bring mutated flowers. <laughs> oh <my> gosh, <laughs> on the spot. On the spot right there. That was you not made it poetry. Poetry. You that made it is this far. Was. Please comment that down below to let us know you made it here. Yep. Oh my God. Uh, you know, so and <laughs> I was going to talk about how, like, even now, like, March and April, we have, like, Chernobyl back in the news because of the Russian and Ukraine war and them not People handling Chernobyl it. properly. Again? For them, we mean, mean Russia. The, the Russians By them, mishandled? I mean Russia. Yeah, Russia not handling the taking over of not, Chernobyl they, they properly. Did not take, they do not take, they, the Russian troops have not taken the nuclear warnings and uh, no entry zones around Chernobyl very seriously. So it's funny. They didn't even tell their soldiers that they were going into Chernobyl. Uh, so now there's a, now there's kind of a little, a little bit of a riot going on being like, I don't want to be placed here. Place me somewhere else. Well, cool. Gwen, it's funny you mentioned that in column. It's really funny you mentioned that because one of the things is um, the Russians just retreated from there and it came to light that the Russian soldiers were commanded to dig foxholes and trenches in the irradiated soil and they had to remove soldiers because they started suffering from radiation poisoning. Oh, I knew they, they started. So I didn't know it was because yeah. of the foxholes, though. Yeah, because they cool. were digging in the irradiated soil in the exclusion zone where they tell you not to go. Yeah. Listen, I know Russia's been incompetent in this war they started, yeah. but like I didn't but, know it was to that level. Yeah, right, and, to, uh, and to uh, bring us out of modern politics. Uh, before sorry, we sorry, get sorry. Completely it was just... by, the Rush by any Russian uh segmented viewers glory to ukraine long may it rain uh, yeah. uh, so the reactor so at uh chernobyl on april 26 1986 was an R rbmk reactor which is 
uh, a Russian for high power channel reactor. It's a Soviet model of uh, nuclear power, which unlike Fukushima, which used water for power generated, power generated, this one actually used, I believe, uh, I, this one actually used stone. I, I can't remember if it said granite or graphite. Uh, I think it's, I think it was, uh, I think it was graphite. Uh, as a yeah, it's, of, it's, it's graphic it, blocks within the yeah, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's, it's it uses a uh, you know graphite as a uh, insulator, uh, no, which I, fun fact, not that great of an insulator because it catches fire in the event of a nuclear meltdown. <laughs> see, when I saw graphic blocks, I was thinking like you know a graphic novel, but just implant impressed Thanks. over the block to like, kind of decorate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the funny thing is is like uh in in my art classes we have used graphite and everyone's like be careful it's very flammable so uh fun yeah. fact about modern light bulbs is the initial filament that they used was graphite because when you put a high-powered electric current through it yep. it would actually start glowing yep and so yeah the graphite blocks were essentially performing the same function as the water of you, know, you heat them up, you get power off of it. Yeah. And it was supposed to be insular, insular because it's you know made of stone. What's going to melt stone? Uh, on April 26, the number four nuclear reactor went into meltdown during a low power test as a result of a power surge that went through the power plant because during this test, the workers ignored basic safety measures and safety <laughs> protocols to run this test. And uh, when the power surge went through, it essentially hypercharged the reactor for all of a second when it was supposed to be off. And uh, that's something you very much do not want to do to a nuclear reactor. The, the irony of that is when you're running a lower power test, you are specifically doing a safety test protocol. And they forgot to put like the circuit breakers on during the safety test. So when power ran through the facility normally, the power surged through the low power test, and the essentially the reactor caught fire and detonated. That's effectively like doing a fire drill, like when you were in school, but throwing a Molotov cocktail before you do the drill. I was about to say, I'm like having flashbacks to when we would do uh fire safety drills at uh, the college dorms that I worked at and the people that would just casually walk out or would be like smoking through and you'd be like, oh, cool. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to set off actual alarms if you do that. Please, uh, please stop. So I, at, when I was in the dorms, uh, we did a fire alarm safety drill and I only found out because my roommate came back into the room and looked at me and was like, you're still asleep? It's like, yeah. Oh, you were asleep. I just woke up. He goes, yeah, they had a fire alarm go off. And, you know, I thought that would have woken you up. And I went, no, but thanks for not waking me up, I guess. Every man for himself. <laughs> I don't have to outrun the fire. I just have to outrun you. Because the fire <laughs> operates on the same the principle of a hungry bear. <laughs> oh, I my God. Yeah. But anyway, God. back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, back away from my absolute menace to society trend. Yes. Um, uh, speaking of safety measures and ignoring them, uh, fun fact about these high power channel reactors is in the 80s, they did not have safety containment buildings like uh, Fukushima did. So those uh, buildings around the reactors, the ones that filled with hydrogen and detonated, those mm -hmm. were containment facilities around the reactors at Fukushima. Chernobyl did not have that, which meant that when the fire broke out and the reactor melted down and exploded, there was absolutely nothing between the radiation, the radioactive core and all its radiation and the rest of the planet. <laughs> well, it's nice to know that Fukushima learned from <laughs> Chernobyl yep. and that we can now learn from Fukushima. <laughs> yep. There's a couple of really, really interesting documentaries um, talking about those um, emergency workers who went into the highly radioactive area and the fact that they did what they did. And inevitably, they, they sacrificed themselves. I mean, there were 28 um, yep. 
firefighters and emergency workers who died of uh, radiation sickness yep. over the next three months. But like they went in, they secured the site and they prevented additional radiation from seeping out. So like they were, mm -hmm. I don't want to say heroes because of the, sh the situation that surrounded the accident, but well, they went in heroism in their yes. actions. They, you know, that they, they acted as heroes. The situation doesn't matter how the situation started. These yeah. firefighters, Yes. And emergency responders. They did not cause this problem, but they responded to it heroically. You can thank call you. them heroes, Justin. Okay, know, thank you for clarifying. I know, I know they speak with a vaguely Russian accent, and it's very hard <laughs> to think positively of that in America, but please. I am not a Russophobe. I am not a Russophobe. But yes, thank you. You you clarified that in a way that I was intending to say. Yeah. But I do not word very well today, yep. and you are yeah. like on a trend. So I'm gonna stop Justin's wording for a minute. So you, you may recall Fukushima lost one worker to radiation poisoning over seven years. Chernobyl yes. lost 28 in three months precisely because of the lack of outer containment between the melting core and uh, the, the emergency responders and the rest of the world. Like this right here is the reason why Chernobyl is considered worse than Fukushima, even though they're both category sevens because Chernobyl actively started killing a lot of people very quickly. <laughs> and it's actually kind of horrifying to talk about. <laughs> Which we didn't even mention the two workers that died instantly because of the explosion. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah, like they... an instant two plus 28. So you had 30 within the first three months. Yep. And uh, Fukushima's death toll at seven years is at four, three from the tsunami one from the radiation. <laughs> so it's actually interesting too about the Chernobyl incident was because the only reason the Western part of the world found out about it was actually due to um, camera processing. Mm -hmm. um, when you developed film, they would get these anomalies in the film development process and they could actually tell that it's due to an increase in radiation in the atmosphere. Yep. Is that what is that how they were able to like track like the radiation like is like go all the way to like Sweden right? Well, Sweden, uh, uh, the one the re the one of the first reasons why we found out about Chernobyl having any sort of issues was the radiation was so widespread it it went all the way from Ukraine to Sweden, and a Swedish nuke uh, a Swedish uh, atmosphere monitoring station detected that the that the air coming into Sweden from the south was heavily irradiated. And so Sweden uh, essentially sounded an alarm and started trying to get the uh, USSR on the phone going, you're south of us. Why is all the air coming up on the on the uh, on the wind currents radioactive? Yeah, oh my gosh. The fallout yeah. the fallout went from Ukraine to Sweden. <laughs> Yeah, and so that's actually how the West found out was uh, Swedish nuclear plant engineers noticed the high levels of radiation. And I actually, to correct myself from earlier, Kodak discovered the U.S. testing because of the film yeah. issue. But the film issue still that. persisted throughout Europe in the same regard because they would that. have film processing plants and it would affect their their um, the dark light process and would effectively ruin the film. <laughs> yeah. yeah, dude. And, uh, J Dark just light some... with film is such a difficult process. Yeah. And uh, just to drive home the point of how far away this is, the distance, just a straight line from from Ukraine to Sweden is 1,500 kilometers or, nine, or about 950 miles. Wow. Damn. The radiation went that far. Well, the radiation in total affected an area of about 150 square kilometers in areas of modern day Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia. Yeah. Yeah, it uh yeah, the immediate yeah, the immediately just irradiated ground, just terrifying. Uh this resulted in thirty kilometer exclusion zone put in place on Chernobyl, much like the uh twenty kilometer evacuation zone put in place around Fukushima initially. Uh so they uh they shut they did that to shut down. And then my personal favorite part of this disaster is uh, 
realizing the fact that radiation was just leaking uh, and there was nothing to contain it because these reactors don't have containment buildings built in, Russia built what they called the sarcophagus. Yes. <laughs> Which is just, is just the best name ever for what they are doing. Uh, as it's just a giant concrete dome designed to seal the uh, Chernobyl radiation inside of it. Yes. And uh, being the USSR, they built it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Because they spent six months building it, and um, it has uh, it has deteriorated several times and required emergency repairs. And there's... Uh, Currently, uh, Ukraine wants to build a more secure building around it and is putting together a several billion dollar slush fund. Well, I know part of it kind of tying back to modern days, like that was Ukraine's plan. And then when Russia took over, there were a lot of fears that they would try to sabotage it and irradiate the area even yeah. further. Yeah, I do not know what has become of this slush fund uh, as it was uh, plans that were put in place back in 2020 prior to the full-on invasion <laughs> yeah so to be determined but one of the things we didn't even mention was the entire evacuation of the area where they relocated over 200,000 people including the town of pripyat which uh, was located three miles from chernobyl and three, had kilometers. A three kilometers i said three miles didn't i Yep. Yeah, he did. The Americanism in me shines again. God save you, the imperialist president. bastard. <laughs> but it had a population of almost fifty thousand people at forty nine three sixty. So there was a lot of people who immediately had to be relocated. And uh, the cool thing about Pripyat now in modern days is it kind of serves a second life, as it's now the setting for a lot of movies, for a lot of uh, video games. Uh, yeah. The abandoned town nature of it, the post-apocalyptic feel, has really been taken into event. And actually, prior to the events of February 2021, you could actually do urban exploration tours of Pripyat and uh, of Chernobyl, staying with away from the high radiation zones. But you could go and explore the abandoned buildings and see, like, it's really more because people literally just left things. You You couldn't pack anything up. You just had to drop and go. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and uh, just uh, a uh, a little note here. It uh, it took them 36 hours to notify and evacuate Pripyat at Chernobyl. Uh, it took Fukushima one hour and 47 minutes to uh, to declare evacuation zones and begin evacuating people. So, like I said, Japan I, was on top of it. I, yeah. So just the difference in response times, uh, too, and just general sense of public well-being uh, is, is also a major factor in the severity of these disasters and their uh, death tolls. Yeah, and I mean, you can definitely tell that um, when Japan was making these power plants, when they were going for this nuclear energy, they definitely were like, let's look at Chernobyl. Let's see what we can do to make that better. And then our emergency plan, if this happens, yeah. how our response is going to be. And I think you can you can really see that. And for starters, uh, we're not going to use a conductor that is highly flammable. <laughs> yep. Yeah. We're going to use a conductor that is the opposite of flammable. Yeah. Japan actually has like a really interesting history of looking at how uh, foreign people have made things or have done things, um, like sending out their engineers or their tradesmen and then coming back to Japan and being like, all right, how can we make this better? And then making it. Um, there's a really interesting like rabbit hole to go down um, during like, uh, like industrial revolutions and different kind of mechanisms. Um, and I think you can see that there. I mean, it, it is also one that a lot of other plants use, like we said, uh, about like one third of U.S. plants are mm -hmm. built like how they were in Fukushima. Yeah, are, so I have the uh, Fukushima or have the general principle of the design of Fukushima. Yeah, yeah. Because it is, yeah. Uh, these reactor types, unfortunately, don't refer to the exact models. They just refer to the method of generating power. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't want to like single out and be like, so, "Oh, yeah. this is just like what it does." So, but I yeah. interesting parallels that you can yeah. see. So like, here, here's the hoping that most modern active nuclear power plants are more advanced than models constructed during the 1970s. Well, what? no. Um, here's the hoping. Uh, you, you. Uh, 
Well, mm. but uh, if, if you look at some interesting uh, news coverages on mm -hmm. nuclear power plants through the decades, you're going to see a lot, a lot of similar, similar, uh, similar explanations like, and sentences. So, like, like, like Justin said, Illinois is uh, the United is uh, one of the largest producers of nuclear power in the United States. So, going to knock on wood again. So, um, you know, here's to hoping that the safety measures have advanced. <laughs> uh, uh, slightly on a different oh, note. Oh, who am I but... kidding? This is a country that can't even maintain roads. <laughs> I was about to say, we live in Illinois. There's like literally 10 potholes in my driveway for my apartment complex. <laughs> Let's just put it this way. How many times have we said we've updated it? And how many times has the governor bought a new house? <laughs> there you go. Column. Um, but Gwen, we, there's actually a place that I'm aware of not too far from where you're at that we could go swimming in a nuclear, uh, nuclear, uh, energy facilities, uh, lake. So the water is warm year round because of its keyword water. is could not should or would, but could. <laughs> Justin, really, Justin, really going for that English your, there. Your, your, your quest to become Sasquatch, it's it's starting to become a problem. All right. <laughs> I mean, is. I mean, we know the beard had its shortcomings, but please. Just let me go back to my people, okay? This coming your people out of are Tennessee it. Canadians. <laughs> I'm sorry, bud. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, that's a big but one. yeah that is that is fukushima and uh what that disaster was how the cleanup is gone and how it's continued uh to affect people today and then kind of comparing it to chernobyl so i hope that was interesting to look to learn about um through our tangents uh because that that is kind of the obstacle of this podcast <laughs> It's both the obstacle and the charm, I think. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit of both. Yeah, yeah. A little bit uh, of column A, a little bit of column B. I mean, we're not even going to go there, <laughs> Justin. We're just not. Um, what, uh, you guys want to say what uh, what ne next week's uh, podcast is? Oh yeah, oh yeah. We should get into what uh, what's coming up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So. Uh, next time, uh, on the 18th of April, uh, we will have our next podcast air. That will be on the Mochi people, a indigenous pre-Columbian society in South America. It's very exciting for us. And I believe really it is the like first it. time we are going to South America on the main podcast. So hooray for that. Yay. That is incredible. So we are trying to get a worldly view. And then also later in this exact same week, we are going to have the way of the samurai HH Reed short, uh, that is dropping on Friday. So be sure to check that out. Be sure to let us know what your thoughts are. Um, if you guys like the podcast, if you want to keep seeing more, we do post videos on our YouTube channel, which is historical humans. Be sure to subscribe, drop a like, um, if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify, be sure to rate the rate the podcast because that helps us get seen more and helps us uh, grow as as a podcast creator because we're just doing this as a hobby and as something fun. And we try to bring you cool, interesting topics that we find fascinating. And if you have yeah. any suggestions, let us know. Yeah. And uh, before we do sign off all the way, because it does co also come out before – the next uh, main podcast does. Uh, we do have HH Reads every Friday, and uh, the Friday of this podcast is Way of the Samurai. And the Friday after that, we will have an excerpt from the Siddhartha by Herman Hesse. Uh, so that is uh, that should also be very fun. Uh, it is the story of the Buddha, a fictionalized account thereof, told by a German writer. So uh, very interesting. <laughs> gonna be interesting yeah yep. well thank you guys for checking this out and thank you all for listening and catch us all in two weeks for the mochi people <laughs>